Primary Children's Center for Safe and Healthy Families and the Division of Child Protection and Family Health of the Pediatrics Department at the University of Utah School of Medicine in Salt Lake City presents The Relationship of Adverse Childhood Experiences to Adult Health Status with Dr. Vincent J. Felitti. Based upon the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, a collaborative effort of Dr. Vincent J. Felitti of Kaiser Permanente and Dr. Robert F. Anda of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. From the Child Trauma Treatment Network of the Intermountain West at its September 2003 Snowbird Conference. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure being here. I hadn't expected the weather to be snow. I, I mean, I think it's wonderful, but when you come from San Diego, it is, it is unexpected. I, I got into this in an, in an unusual way. Some years ago, 28 years ago, I had the opportunity to put together a Department of Preventive Medicine at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. And as part of that department, we built a series of risk abatement programs, one of which was a weight program. And we were doing pretty well with that. We had a powerful technology that enabled us non-surgically to take weight off people safely and reliably at the, weight, at the rate of about 300 pounds a year. Extraordinary, but true. And by 1985, we were seeing about 1,500 people a year in the program. We were very disturbed by the high dropout rate that we had. What was particularly disturbing was the people dropping out were the ones who successfully were losing weight. I mean, that really drove us nuts. And ultimately, in despair, I started interviewing a large number of people who were dropping out in the course of successfully losing weight. And having no idea what I was looking for, did basically a social worker's timeline interview. What did you weigh when you were born, when you were in kindergarten, sixth grade, if a woman, when you began to menstruate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And by accident, I put in a question in this sequence, how old were you when you first became sexually active? And I misspoke myself early on and asked some woman how much she weighed when she first became sexually active. And she said 40 pounds and then blurted out it was with my father and started sobbing. And I remember thinking to myself, hmm, second incest case I've seen in 24 years of practice. <laughs> little, little did I know. <laughs> Ten, ten days later, I ran into the same thing and fortunately had the wit to conclude that I was not likely starting the third 24-year cycle within ten days. And as I pursued the issue, really became quite, quite disturbed because it seemed every other person I was talking with was giving me a history of childhood sexual abuse. And I remember, you know, strongly feeling this really can't be true. People, people would know some, someone would have told me in medical school if this, <laughs> if this were true. 186 patients later, it turned out not to be every other person. It turned out to be 55%. And I remember still being concerned, perhaps I was introducing observer bias in some way and, and eliciting this needlessly, falsely, incorrectly. And so I got five other people to interview 100 additional patients, and they turned up the same information. And then a few years later, I was in Atlanta talking with some people at CDC, and, and they told me, look, you know, no one is going to believe 286 cases, no matter how well you've studied them. What we need to do is put together an epidemiologically sound study with thousands of patients. And so we did. Because in the Department of Preventive Medicine, we provide to 58,000 adults a year comprehensive biomedical, psychological, and social evaluation. It's a, it's a quite remarkable place. And so it was fairly easy to ask 26,000 consecutive people whether they would be willing to help us on condition of anonymity and the information never appearing in their medical records, understand more about how what happened to people in childhood might affect their health as adults. 
that's what I will share with you. Overwhelmingly, what you will see is the results of what happens to people who have abusive experiences in childhood or grow up in dysfunctional households and never have access to any sort of treatment. This is the largest study of its type that's ever been done to examine the health and social effects of adverse childhood experiences over the course of a lifetime. Essentially, we're asking, how do you get from here to here, from a newborn infant with toady potential to the man who is broken biomedically, psychologically, and socially, who's got the cardboard sign on his, sec on his neck at the, at the corner. We looked at several categories of childhood abuse and neglect, and several categories of household dysfunction. And we picked these really empirically, because as we spoke with people in more and more depth in the weight program, the categories that we studied kept turning up more and more frequently. The study is simple in concept. It has a retrospective and a prospective component. We are meeting people here and asking them about what happened here on average a half century earlier. The average age participant is 57 years old. The population was 80% white, 10% black, 10% Asian, 50 and one half percent female, 49 and one half percent male. 74% had been to college, 46% had graduated from college. In no way could you dismiss this as a marginalized population. This was really a section out of the middle class of a major American city. Basically, it was you and me. We did the first, we did the retrospective portion in two waves so that we could stop halfway through and regroup and see if we needed to correct anything. And then we have also a prospective portion going on, which is tracking these people forward in time. We now are at the five year point and hope to go to 10, matching what happened back here a half century ago against current pharmacy utilization, ER visits, doctor office visits, hospitalizations, and death. You have the bibliography of the ACE study to date, and you have in your folders information about how to track it forward over time and find out what's coming out new. If anyone wants to correspond with me, if we don't have a chance to talk here, my email address is vjfmd, sdca, as in San Diego, California, at msn.com, vjfmd, sdca at msn.com. I'm a pretty good email correspondent, so feel free to. The, time, sure. VJF MD SDCA at msn.com. MSN is in Microsoft Network. The, the economic consequences, by the way, we've taken a peek at this, are huge. I'll give you a summary of what we found and then spend the rest of the time providing you evidence for why this is true. What we found is that the things that we termed adverse childhood experiences and, and that I will define momentarily are remarkably common. What is uncommon is their recognition or their acknowledgement. They are well concealed by time, by shame, by secrecy, and by social taboo. They turn out to be strong predictors of what happens later in life in terms of health risks, in terms of disease, and as you will see, in terms of premature mortality. And that combination of their high prevalence and their great power makes this statement not an overblown one, 
makes adverse childhood experiences the leading determinant of what happens to the health and social well-being of a nation's population. Okay, we looked at three categories of abuse. If you read the original article and see the questions that we used, you will realize that we are talking about the rather heavy end of things. For the moment, take my word for it until you look at the article. <clears throat> we looked at recurrent emotional abuse. One in nine people. This is, the, the, believe me, the heavy end of things. Recurrent physical abuse, such as by mothers beating children with the wires, on the uh, electric wires on irons or with wire coat hangers or fathers with fists, belts, or objects. <clears throat> One in nine people. Contact sexual abuse. Contact sexual abuse, 22%. For women, that was 28%. For men, it was 16%. 22 was the average for both. In terms of household dysfunction, growing up in a household where one of the members was alcoholic or a drug user. Could be anybody, could be your mother, your father, your brother, could be an uncle living in the house. One of the household members was either alcoholic or a drug user. One in four people. Growing up in a household where someone was mentally ill, chronically depressed, suicidal, or institutionalized. One in five people. Growing up in a household where a mother was treated violently. One in eight people. Growing up in a household where one of the members was imprisoned during your childhood. One in 30 people. Here's what this looks like. The eighth category that we added in the second wave was growing up without both biological parents. One of the things that we discovered in terms of losing a parent is that if one is going to lose a parent incontestably, it is best to lose that parent by death and worst to lose that parent by abandonment. Um, just him and my mom divorced and uh, when I was, I'd probably say five or six the last time and uh, he moved to a different state, um, got remarried, had uh, more kids and just never, no contact really. So, so after he and your mother got divorced, he never came back to see you? Um, no, I went to, I went to, I stayed with him two weeks when I was a senior in high school. Stayed with him two weeks and... But wait a minute, he left when you were five? Yeah. And you didn't see him again till you were a senior in high school? Till I was a senior in high school, yeah. Did he find you or did you find him? No, uh, I found him. I, I used to call him a lot, write him a lot, and, uh, he would never, uh, write back or call back or anything, but, you know, I was majorly uh, the one trying to, you know, contact him. So, so when you saw him years later, when you were a senior in high school, what, what happened? How did that it was a, it was a good experience. Um, it made me, it made me feel, uh, Maybe we, we would be closer and uh, have more contact, but um, it was a good experience. It was really, I really had a good time, and uh, but never no contact after that. So, you know, I tried, and but still. How much did you weigh then? Then I, I weighed, uh, <laughs> it's really fascinating. I was weighing about, 240, 245 or so, but uh, <laughs> that's funny. But during that time, that two week period of time, I remember coming back weighing two, around 210 or so. I lost probably you lost 30 pounds that during that period of time, yeah. And what happened afterwards? Oh, gain weight back. <laughs> oh yeah, I um, probably by the end of my Senior year, I was probably around 255. 
An interesting example of losing weight under a very specific condition, spontaneously, without intending to, and then regaining more. And the question is why? So just keep that in mind. You're looking at that man after he has lost 180 pounds in the weight program. And of course the practical question is, why did he get fat to start with? Okay, to, to deal with the mass of data that we were dealing with from 18,000 people, we needed to create some sort of a simple scoring system, so we created the so-called ACE score. If you were exposed to none of the categories that I showed you before, the ACE score was zero. If you're exposed to any three, it was three. To any five, it was five. We did not count within a category. So if you grew up in a home with one alcoholic, that counted the same as if you grew up in a home with one alcoholic and one addict. If you were raped once, that counted the same as being raped three times, etc. If anything, this understates the point. One of the things that was surprising to us was that in this very middle class population, fewer than half of the people had an ACE score of zero. And one in 15 had an ACE score of four or more. From the standpoint of a physician in practice, that means every day he is going to see at least one, most likely two people with an ACE score of four or more and the relevant question is, who are they going to be? They are going to be the people with chronic symptoms. They are going to be the most intractable problems of the day. You'll see specifically shortly. Another thing that we learned was that if at least one ACE was present, at least exposure to any one category was present, then it was highly likely that there were other categories to which one was exposed. And the A score was likely to range, given one, to actually range between 2.4 and 4. I think the calculation was that if you had an A score of 1, you had an 84% likelihood of being exposed to actually more categories than that. Let's start on the light end of things. We will talk about smoking, smoking one pack a day in Southern California, where there's a great deal of legitimatized abuse that is heaped on people who smoke. You can't smoke in trains, you can't smoke in restaurants and hotels and bars and office buildings, etc. I mean, in an office building, typically you have to go outside and stand in an orange painted square, you know, to enjoy your camel cigarette, usually painted near the garbage cans, etc. So, so one of the things that's happened is that all of, the, all of the lightweight smokers have gone away. All the people that used to smoke two, three, four cigarettes a day have disappeared. And now you have people who are smoking in the heavy duty range. And, and that number has been persistent in spite of the heavy duty public health effort against it. I will show you this pattern repeatedly. This is a pattern from infectious disease days. It is the so-called dose response curve. We're looking at dose, not of microorganisms, but dose of number of categories of adverse childhood experience to which one has been exposed and matching it against response, namely the likelihood of whatever it is that we are studying. And what you see here is that there is a strong graded relationship between ACE score and likelihood of being a pack a day or more smoker in a place where you suffer a lot of humiliation and mistreatment as a result of doing that. Interesting observation. Because after all, people say that smoking is really due to an addiction to nicotine. This man's a three-pack-a-day smoker. He is also a, I would describe him as a semi-pro saloon fighter. He earns, a, <laughs> he earns a very good living. He earns a very good living as a high-voltage electrician on major construction projects. I uh, spent uh, 225 years drowning out some uh, 
poor childhood experiences with drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. I've gotten rid of the drugs, got rid of the alcohol. Next thing I got to get rid of is the cigarettes. And uh, I had no idea that the nicotine played such an important part in keeping that door closed. In keeping the door closed too. The memories that I've blocked out with all these years with the alcohol and the drugs. So you see what's happening to you now as related to what happened to you decades ago? Yep. I found a way to block the emotions and the memories. With? Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. Most of you perhaps are aware that the most commonly used street drug in the country is methamphetamine. Most people are not aware that the first ant antidepressant medication introduced into North America by Ciba Pharmaceuticals in 1932 was dextroamphetamine, a very close chemical relative. Isn't it interesting that the most commonly used street drug in the country, probably the world, has potent antidepressant activity? So we will now progress from the behavior of smoking to disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, otherwise known as emphysema. What you see here, we've color coded the ACE score. As the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of emphysema goes up. Profound shift. And we have now gone from psychosocial experience in childhood to behavior, smoking, to organic disease. And here we are looking at the initiation of permanent smoking, regular smoking, before the age of 14. Not just, you know, sneaking a cigarette in the bathroom with the window open, but becoming a regular smoker before the age of 14. And you see that has the same graded relationship to ACE4 that I've shown you before. Those of you with a statistical bent should know that every piece of data that I'm showing has a p-value of better than 0 .001. This interesting woman once took herself from 420 to 280 pounds by buying the Dr. Atkins diet book and following the directions in it. At that point, her husband made to her the comment, guess I'll have to get me a new fat woman now. But as far as being molested, that's stuck with me all my life. You know, it's still in the back of my mind. Um, I am in therapy. Um, I too suffer from depression. Um, yeah, the most traumatic was my mother, losing my mother, most definitely. Which had the most to do with your putting on so much weight? <sighs> That's a hard question. I think I started getting heavier and heavier after my father and mother divorced. But then I, I started really getting heavy after the molestation. And I would try to take it off and then I would just gain it all back and then some. Gain it all back and then some once again. When I asked her what she thought her husband meant by his comment, guess I'll have to get me a new fat woman now, she said that she thought that the fact that she was more physically agile was in some way threatening to him, and the fact that she had become somewhat more outspoken at the lesser weight was also threatening to him. Ultimately, to provide the safety of a continuing marriage, she regained the weight. We looked at self-defined adult alcoholism. Most people do not loosely define themselves as alcoholic, if you ask them. So if anything, the point is probably underrepresented here. But when we ask people the simple question, have you ever considered yourself to be an alcoholic? What we saw was that as the ACE score went up, the likelihood of being a self-defined alcoholic went up from a little less than 3% to 16%, a rise of over 500% in a stepwise graded fashion.
One of the things we saw in the weight program was that depression was very common. The mythology of you know the jolly fat man or the jolly fat woman is precisely that. It is a protective myth. I've been looking for 18 years for that individual and have not met one yet. So depression is something that we deal with a great deal. And some people, as you know, say it's genetic. It certainly runs in families. But so too does speaking the same language. Some people say that genetics affect depression by causing chemical imbalances. You certainly are likely to hear people talk about not being depressed but having a chemical imbalance. A man at Stanford named Alan Barbour wrote a wonderful book in which he made the point that depression is not a disease, it is a normal response to abnormal life experiences. I think that's true. Let me give you the evidence. We looked at self-defined, self-defined chronic depression. And what we saw in red women and yellow men, it's an interesting point that we won't go into as to why there is a difference. But what you see here is that you're going from about 17% to bumping 60%. And so if indeed there is a meaningful genetic component, it's got some space to operate in, but most of the space has been occupied already. And incontestably, there are chemical imbalances, but they simply illustrate the difference between mechanism and basic cause in the same sort of way that people who hope to use leptin as the explanation for obesity are mistaking mechanism for basic cause. If you were to tie someone in a chair just out of reach of a rabid wolf, you'd have a pretty, pretty, pretty anxious person their adrenaline levels would be enormously high. If you didn't think the situation through or were so narrowly focused that you didn't choose to look at the wolf, you might say that high adrenaline levels were the cause of anxiety. In fact, they simply are the intermediary mechanism. If you're dubious about self-defined chronic depression, then we can switch to self-acknowledged prior suicide attempts. And if there's something that people don't talk about very much, it's the number of times they've previously attempted suicide. So if anything, I think, once again, this probably underrepresents the point. But what you see is matching ACE score against self-acknowledged suicide attempts you have a really remarkable rise. If you go out to an A score of six or more, you can get up to between a 31 and 50 fold increase in attempting suicide in adolescence. That is to say a 3100 to 5000% increase. And the people who are epidemiologists for a living tell me that these numbers are of a magnitude that they professionally are likely to see once in a career. The technique of population attributable risk is a fairly simple concept. In other words, what portion of a condition in a population can be attributed to some specific risk factor? The calculation is, is complex, but the idea is fairly simple. And when we look at chronic, at current depression, we see that we can probably acknowledge safely more than half is related to adverse childhood experiences. Chronic depression, about 40%. Attempted suicide, close to 60%. We looked at promiscuity because of its link to sexually transmitted diseases, particularly AIDS. We, in our conservative way, thought 50 lifetime sexual partners was a lot. I've, I've had a a number of patients tell me that that would be a, an ordinary year. <laughs> but, but whatever the case, <coughs> using this index, you see that as the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of promiscuity goes up. And so too, 
does the likelihood of sexually transmitted disease. We looked at teenage pregnancy, big problem. Most people who look at this look at the girls who become pregnant as teenagers. We decided to look at the males, be they teenagers or adults, who get teenage girls pregnant. And we were far enough into this to wonder whether perhaps these males might have been abused themselves as kids and this was some way of acting out. And indeed, that turned out to be the case because as you see here, we looked at the age at which those males were molested as children and the younger the age at which they were molested, the greater the likelihood of them later getting a teenage girl pregnant. We looked at unintended pregnancy. This was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association about a year and a half ago. It's in the reference list that you have. And most people blow this off as, you know, an unfortunate accident. Well, as is often the case, things that we conveniently describe as accidents are not accidental. And what you see here is that as the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of unintended pregnancy and its treatment, elective abortion, goes up. So sort of a running subtotal now, if you compare, now we'll use a score zero to a score five or more, multiple sexual partners at the level we're talking about increases 5.8 fold, 580%. Three or more marriages, 3.8 fold or 380%. Unwanted pregnancy leading to abortion goes up 290%. We looked at rape. Surprise. The first surprise was how common rape was. I didn't know that until I started talking with patients in the WAIT program. And the next surprise was this. The powerful relationship to adverse childhood experiences. Think how this is. Why is this? What makes this happen? What are the intervening links that make this operational? Why would adverse childhood experiences make typically a woman, sometimes a man, more susceptible to rape later in life? It's a hard question and it's an important question to think about and perhaps someone will bring it up later. And this, we looked at the making of madness the presence of hallucinations. Now what you see is as the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of a history of hallucinations goes up until you're at the 10% level with an ACE score of seven or more. Many of these people would be defined as schizophrenic. Of course, the practical question is, why is somebody schizophrenic? And for those who would point out that people with high A scores often use alcohol or drugs, and perhaps that's the real issue, that they are having hallucinations, we corrected for that in the other color of the bar, and you see essentially the same thing. So comparing an A score of zero to one of five or more, the likelihood of being involved in intimate partner violence, domestic violence, spouse beating, whatever you want to call it, goes up over 500%. The likelihood of being raped goes up almost 900%. We did not, no. And looking at population attributable risk, it appears that you can account for about half of all depression leading to suicide attempts. You can lay that onto ch adverse childhood experiences. Being raped, almost two thirds. Being involved in domestic violence, about half. Go back to addiction for a moment. I think this is a fair representation of what most people believe that addiction 
is something that happens because of characteristics that are intrinsic in the molecular structure of some, of some chemical. You know, it sounds good. It's comforting in a way. You know, my kid's a heroin addict because this evil wretch selling heroin, a well-known addicting substance, moved into the neighborhood. We found very much the opposite. That addiction highly correlates with characteristics that are intrinsic in that individual's childhood experiences. The implications of the difference are enormous. I mean, if you want to do something about drug use or drug abuse, drug use is really the better term, actually, not drug abuse. It takes you in a totally different direction. Here's the evidence. We look at the extreme intravenous drug use because it's sometimes easier to see by looking at the extremes. And so what we see is that when you compare A score zero with A score four or more, the likelihood of becoming an intravenous drug user at some point later in life goes up 12 fold or 1,200%. If you move this out to A score six or more, it goes up to 46 fold, 4,600%. Sort of a running subtotal again, A score is zero compared to A score five or more, self-acknowledged alcoholism over five-fold, intravenous drug use over nine-fold, self-acknowledged suicide attempts essentially 17-fold. And when we look at what part of the problem in populations might be attributed to the category of adverse childhood experiences. About two-thirds of alcoholism, about half of all drug abuse or use, and about three-fourths of intravenous drug use. And so we ended up in deep water where we never anticipated being. I mean, we started out trying to figure out why people we're fleeing the weight program and destroying our reputation of being successful. But in fact, the things that I've been showing you are the risk factors that underlie the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. With an A score of zero, you have a very medically uninteresting population non-obese, non-smoking, non-alcoholic, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, etc. I mean, no, no internist has a chance of making a living with that group. <laughs> but with an A score of four or more, I mean, this is big medicine. Is that how you choose your patients? <laughs> it may be the way they choose themselves. Well, let's take a different approach to all of this. Let us look at the null hypothesis. Let's, let's say, well, you know, it's maybe kind of overblown what this guy is saying. So let us assume for a moment that there's no relationship between adverse childhood experiences and adult health status. If that's true, then the 58,000 people a year coming into the department should have no particular age gradient related to ACE score. You know, it's, a, it's a strange thought, but it's logical if you think of it for a moment. And when we look at people with an ACE score of zero, see what you'd expect. The most common age quantile is the oldest, over 65. The least common is the youngest, under 35. You know, no surprise, young people do not see much reason to go to the doctor. You get older, things start going wrong, and conclude you might die someday, etc. So this is pretty, pretty expected. 
But when we move to a score two, something has caused that expected distribution pattern to reverse. What had been the most common age quantile, the oldest, has become the least common. What had been the least common has become the most common. And when you move to a score four, you see that the most common age quantile at an A score of zero has almost disappeared. And we were very worried when we first came upon this because I was in Atlanta at the time and, and we, we were working with over 600,000 pages of data and we lived in mortal fear that somehow we would lose control of it. And when we saw this, we you know, really thought we had lost control of it. It took us two days to point out what many patients point out in a few seconds. Oh, you mean they died? And that, of course, is what happened. I've shown you the relationship of adverse childhood experiences to health risks, like smoking, to diseases, like emphysema, and now to the consequence of diseases. Someone thinking carefully about this might say, well, maybe they don't come through the department for some reason. We looked into that possibility, and we found that in any four-year period, 81% of all of the adults who were members in San Diego come through the department at least once. And then when we looked at the medical records of those 19% who didn't and compared them with the 81% who do, we could not discern any recognizable difference between the groups. So I think this is not only a real thing, but it's simply a logical progression of what we have been talking about. Putting it a different way, many chronic diseases in adults are determined decades earlier in childhood. When I was doing infectious disease work, if somebody had asked me, you know, how might what happens to a kid affect their health a half century later, I probably would have said, well, they might get rheumatic fever and you know, have alveolar heart disease a half century later, or if they lived in, in Russia, maybe they'd get diphtheria and have residual diphtheritic neuritis. Hmm, sounds pretty smart. And those things are true, but, but they're really dust. <coughs> the big action is not from organic disease in childhood. The big action is from adverse childhood experiences. Not only that, but the things that we term risk factors not only predispose to disease, but they, looking the other direction, are remarkably good windows of insight into earlier life events. They won't tell you what they are precisely, but they will identify with very high probability what's likely to be there. And poets sometimes recognize that more quickly than other people. And so there's that wonderful line from T.S. Eliot, in my end is my beginning. And we commonly dismiss these things as bad habits or self-destructive behavior. And that totally, totally misses their functionality. I mean, no one smokes to get lung cancer or bladder cancer or coronary artery disease. No one shoots heroin to get heart valve infections. People smoke for relief because nicotine is a beneficial psychoactive agent. It has detrimental effects incontestably. It is also beneficial. Sometimes we find it difficult to believe that opposing powerful forces can go on simultaneously. But one of the things that we learned in the weight program is that people typically come in on the one hand wanting very much to lose weight, and on the other hand often are terrified, usually unconsciously, but sometimes not, of the changes in social, sexual, and physical expectations that a major weight loss will impose on them. So it's important to look at the functional aspects of what we protectively dismiss as dysfunctional behavior. I've been talking about medical things up to now. We'll switch to social impact, how you do your work. Most people do not go out of their way to falsely claim that they're inept at doing their work. 
So if anything, this probably understates the point once again. But when we look at self-acknowledged serious job problems, do you have serious job, do you have serious problems carrying out your work? We see that as the ACE score goes up, you have a progressive increase in the likelihood of that. And for people who are familiar with occupational medicine, it turns out that much of what causes time to be lost from work is actually predetermined decades earlier by adverse childhood experiences and may simply be triggered later by something that happens at work. This is an interesting sequence because this is the real kid who once belonged to a secretary in the department. Here he is at seven, unhappy looking kid. But, you know, who thinks seriously about asking, why is that kid unhappy at seven? That's the way kids are, he'll get over it. Affective response. Here's the same kid as a teenager, sullen looking kid, but that's the way teenagers are. You know, he'll get over it. He never got to this point. He got to this point. His mother drew me this picture about a year after he had hanged himself shortly before Christmas. We're not used to thinking of suicide as a coping mechanism. It is. And we should think of it that way. The story was that that kid had been extensively molested by his father as a child. But the things that we call risk factors are effective coping devices. This is an important idea. Because another way of saying it is, many of the things termed public health problems are in fact personal solutions. They are personal solutions to problems that are well hidden by time, by shame, by secrecy, by social taboo. And perhaps that later, that latter observation has a lot to do with why we are doing so poorly with trying to change the prevalence of certain public health problems. This stuff is notably difficult to deal with. Those of you who deal with children understand that, and perhaps you will have little difficulty accepting the idea that it's even harder to deal with an adult 50 years later, after patterns have been set for half a century. But here's an interesting insight. This is a picture that was on the cover of the Journal of the American Medical Association about Ten years ago. It looks through the dining room window of a family that eats together. Mother berating father sitting there sullenly with knife upraised, kid cringing towards his mother. And the real question of course is what is the impact of this if it happens recurrently day after day? Here's some insight into that. This is a PET scan, essentially a, 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 an x-ray showing biochemical activity of the brains of two three-year-old children. This one being an ordinary American child, this one being a child who was raised in a Romanian orphanage. People who study these things say that currently Romanian orphanages are the worst institutions of their type in the world. And what you see is that there are a lot of areas in this brain that do not have any biochemical activity. And it is no stretch of the imagination to believe that at a time when brain is being formed, 
that lack of normal biochemical activity may have something to do with the neuroanatomical structure that is laid down. If you want to read a fascinating book about what's known about this, I mean, a truly remarkable book because it's so easy to read and, and the experiments in it are so remarkably interesting and ingenious. The book is called Magic Trees of the Mind. The author uses trees metaphorically for interneuronal connections, for synaptic connections. And the author is a woman named Marion Diamond, as in Diamond Ring. She is a old-time neurobiologist at Berkeley. A remarkably good book, Magic Trees of the Mind, Marion Diamond. Back to the old public health problem, personal solution. That's a pretty heavy-handed statement. I, I feel very comfortable making it. I mean, essentially, this is what psychoanalysts have been saying for a hundred years. But they have been saying it, you know, based on two cases or four, and we're saying it based on 18,000. One way of describing what we've been talking about would be this way. You have this large base of individuals with adverse childhood experiences. Most of them are going to be impaired as a result in some way, maybe socially, maybe emotionally, maybe cognitively. I mean, this is, this is not the way to get a scholarship to BYU or Stanford or wherever. By the time they become adolescents and have some freedom, they ordinarily will try to do something to feel better, and hence initiate what we term health risk behaviors, which might equally properly be called self-help behaviors. Those over time will produce disease and disability in many of them, and a significant portion of them will die early. You have a copy of this pyramid in your handout folder. Alice Miller is a Swiss psychoanalyst who has written a, a remarkable number of interesting monographs on various aspects of this. If you're not familiar with her, look up her name on the Amazon website. Um, the truth about childhood is stored up in our bodies and lives in the depths of our souls. Our intellect can be deceived, our feelings can be numbed and manipulated, our perceptions can be shamed and confused or our bodies tricked with medication, but our soul never forgets. And because we are one, one whole soul in one body, someday our body will present its bill. She, of course, is talking present its bill metaphorically, but in the prospective arm of the study, we are also looking at it literally. The cost of this is truly enormous. Another line from T.S. Eliot, home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the patterns more complicated of dead and living. In my end is my beginning. Whoever would have thought that pediatrics is the breeding ground for internal medicine? So one might sensibly ask, how do you get from here, where we are, which is not too good, to where we theoretically could be. And from what we've seen, there would be two essential pieces necessary to bridge that gap. One is acknowledgement that these problems exist. There is very little of such acknowledgement now. And two is the recognition of such cases in medical practice. There is exceedingly little of that now. The bigger problem is this. If, that, if any health insurer, Kaiser Permanente, Intermountain, whatever, were to make a big investment in terms of improving parenting skills of 
people now, that may or may not have a benefit next year. It's a complicated issue. But certainly the health-related benefit, the organic disease-related benefit, is going to be many years or decades downstream. They are not likely to be with Kaiser Permanente or Intermountain or whatever at that point. You know, there'll be a Blue Cross or HealthNet or some, some other organization. So, so to get a big company to make a serious investment in preventive measures that are beneficial but that have a long-term benefit is understandably going to be difficult. In one of the handouts that you have, which is subtitled Turning Gold into Lead, the article closes with an actual case that I was asked to consult on as I was finishing writing the article. And I think you'll find that an interesting case because it shows two different ways of looking at something. Can you do this? Can you recognize these cases in medical practice? Yes, no question you can. And because of what we've learned in the ACE study, because of what we learned trying to resolve our annoyance with people fleeing the weight program and taking their success, our success with them, because of that, we have routinely sought, sought these issues now in the past 400,000 patients who have gone through the department. It's a big number. You know, it truly can be done. Everybody, everybody. Of course, what everyone is afraid of is, well, you know, my God, what if, what if that patient says yes? So here's a good one-liner to remember. How has that affected you later in life? Not has, how has that affected you later in life? So you were molested as a kid by your grandfather. Tell me how that affected you later in life. So you were the one who found your father hanging in the garage. Tell me how that affected you later in life. People will be fearful of opening Pandora's box, so to say, but it doesn't happen. The answers I can tell you range from 20 seconds to about a minute. They are concise, often associated with crying, but there's a lot of things you know, really that deserve crying in the world. And what people tell you is remarkably instructive in terms of trying to figure out what to do to be helpful. Now, we ask these questions by questionnaire, by a very well-devised questionnaire that we've developed in the course of treating 1.1 million patients or evaluating 1.1 million patients in this department in the course of the past 28 years. I've gotten pretty good at the questionnaire. The questionnaire, well-devised questionnaire, is... is much better at getting this information than a face-to-face -face interview. Because, you know, we're never at our best. We're going to be tired one day, pressed for time another day, irritated another day. You're going to turn out to be the wrong sex, the wrong race, the wrong age, the wrong hairdo, whatever, for that particular patient. People attribute to a well-devised questionnaire or a touchscreen computer whatever characteristics they seem to need So our ability to get this information is predicated on getting it quasi-anonymously where we're the anonymous person. And then, of course, obviously at some point it has to be dealt with in a conventional interpersonal manner. But there's an important idea in there. And then... I think the single most important thing we do is to help a person tell the worst secret of their life to somebody who is deemed socially important and come out of that still feeling that they are an acceptable human being. Not by being told that, but by shaking hands and asking them to come back and talk more about those things in a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a month or whatever. So, here's the building in which I work. We do a good bit of our work on the whole top floor of this building. 
And in the past, and since 1975, we've evaluated in detail 1.1 million patients on that floor. It's kind of a mind-boggling idea, but it's true. Um, and we've, we've ultimately built a system that is the reverse of conventional medical practice. Conventional medical practice depends on symptoms that is, visits that basically are symptom initiated. The work is done by a physician with nursing support. Okay, history is taken related to the symptom. Patients examined, symptom related laboratory studies are done, maybe another visit to come to a conclusion. We've done the reverse of that. And, and by IPASS, what we're talking about is, is individual and population health assessment system. Lots of questions that are unusual. Down in the dumps are depressed, nervousness, drink more than you think is good for you, use street drugs, been raped or sexually molested as a child, been physically abused, been verbally abused, etc. So comprehensive history on everybody at the outset, not symptom initiated. That questionnaire is put into a digital scanner, totally reformatted by body systems in a way that physicians are used to dealing with things. A large block of measurements and biochemical tests are also carried out. Then at the second visit, review of the history, review of the laboratory tests, full physical examination, coming to some conclusion and plan, and a written letter of summary. Roles are reversed. The work is done by nurse practitioners or physician assistants. The role of the physician here is in a supervisory role to provide support and advice whenever necessary. And we've now carried out this version of the system with about 450,000 times gone since the slide was made, middle class San Diegans. The work is highly accepted by physicians. They're not happy to receive some of the information, but they certainly don't doubt its reliability. It's, it's provided a major improvement on current practice. It has been cost effective. It's provided a major marketing advantage to Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego. The people who sell Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego tell me that health appraisal is probably the major marketing tool they have in terms of speaking with potential member groups. So in medical practice, it is it is, we have a, a really an extraordinary technology for secondary and tertiary care. In, in primary care, where I work, we have a very primitive processes in general for information gathering, for record keeping, for patient feedback. And we end up working with partial information routinely. And our efforts commonly are not cumulative. With this system, providing comprehensive biomedical, psychological, and social evaluation to everyone at the outset of ongoing care by providing educational feedback by letter of summary to patients and by videotapes, etc., by providing a lifetime health plan, by making available matching risk abatement programs, by providing password protected and internet based medical records, we've seen some interesting things. In 1977, when we were doing the biomedical version of this work, going through the department was associated with an 11% reduction in doctor office visits in the subsequent year. I was surprised by that because we find new things, we generate work. But in 77, when we're doing a very conventional biomedical evaluation, we had a net effect 11% reduction in doctor office visits the next year. That was very pleasing to me. More recently, an outside company did an analysis of 125,000 patients going through the department. To my utter amazement, there was a 35% reduction in doctor office visits in the year subsequent to going through this process. Two years out, that reverted to the prior baseline. Now, it's an interesting question. Why, for one year, this kind of approach is associated with a 35% reduction in doctor office visits? The cost consequences of that, obviously, are huge. So we're not talking about a reduction in doctor office visits due to improved health. We're talking about a reduction in doctor office visits due to reduced anxiety about health. Because at least in adult medicine, 
the driving force behind doctor office visits is not health, it is anxiety about health. Important distinction. And so going through this kind of comprehensive evaluation has a significant anxiety reducing effect that lasts about a year. So there's a short-term benefit in adults. Whether there would be in children, I have no idea. Anyway, this is what we've done, and this is what we've done with it, which is only a bare beginning. I mean, essentially, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study provides a blueprint for altering medical practice, not by buying more MRI machines and so forth, but by altering the initial approach, the entry into the system. So we have put this into scale on a very large scale. We do this routinely with 58,000 adults a year. It is possible to do it if you are set up properly to do it. It is possible to deal with it, but you may have to put together some unconventional ways of helping people. Because the idea of saying, well, yeah, you know, we're firm for psychotherapy, that's a nice way of avoiding reality, because the magnitude of this problem is enormous. Most people can't afford psychotherapy. So we've devised other things, providing people things to read, using theater techniques in small groups, because it turns out if you can find an emotionally stable actor or actress to help you with this, they'll, they'll do that at a much lesser cost than will a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker. It also works very well if you think about it. That really has been the role of theater from the beginning, to help people think about things that otherwise were too difficult to think about. That's the role of soap operas. You know, if you're educated, you look down your nose at those. But the real role of soap operas is to help people think about life problems. Anyway, that's where we are from trying to figure out why people were fleeing success and ruining our reputation. So if you'd like to discuss any of this further, I'd be happy to. Yes. No, not anything that I could formally formally present. Informally, I would say that the things that we're doing, and I, I will add some to what I mentioned, are valuable, acceptable, effective, and affordable. Otherwise, we wouldn't be continuing them. Some other things we did, autobiographical writing. There's a psychologist at the University of Texas named James Pennybaker, P-E-N-N-E-B-A-K-E-R, a lot of stuff in the literature, including a few books on the role in med medical practice of therapeutic writing. I often tell patients, look, you know how to use a computer? Terrific. I want you to send me an autobiography of your life in five-year segments as an email attachment. Make sure you have the first segment into me before you come back. The record thus far is from a former Miss Pittsburgh of 1962 who taught me that if you have a daughter, you would not want her to be Miss Anything. <clears throat> Miss Pittsburgh, who was once a very, very attractive woman before she decided that that was incompatible with any sense of safety in her life, was also a very proficient typist and had won a number of prizes at this. And she has sent me now 264 pages of single space typing. She's only up to her middle 40s, <laughs> when she's actually in her 60s. I, I concluded, even though I'm a pretty fast reader, that, that whether I read it or not is not the important part. It's the part, the important part is somebody doing it, having it pass through their mind again, etc. And Penny Baker showed that while this is initially disturbing to people, ultimately, it, it's quite ameliorative and, and indeed has a distinct effect on, on doctor office visits. Another technique that, that I, f I really became familiar with at the insistence of a, of a woman who had very successfully been treated for some, some 
big scale incest problems as a, as a child um, is medical hypnosis. Now it's easy to hypnotize anybody, I mean I, I can do that. To do something skillful with someone when they're in a, in a trance state, that's, that's the rub. If you can find a skillful hypnotherapist, you can sometimes accomplish a great deal, really, and, and sometimes highly improbable things in relatively short periods of time. I, I feel very lucky that I know one such person in San Diego County, another one in Los Angeles County. I'm sure there are more, but yes? Given that most of us in this room do work with children, and that's really kind of the purpose of our, our network, our organization, sure. do you, do you, does any of your data point to um, the, the benefits or provide information to those of us who, who work therapeutically with children who have had adverse childhood experiences to, to the benefits of treatment and potentially staving off some of these problems later in life? I, I, I cannot answer that. I, I can tell you that most, overwhelmingly, most of the people that we saw never had any treatment of any kind. Anecdotally, I will tell you that those who did seem to be doing somewhat better than those who didn't. But that's purely anecdotal. We, we have not looked at that point in any formal way because so few people. See, you have to remember we're looking 50 years after the fact. If this stuff is denied today, imagine you know, how much it was denied in 1950 and 1960. Yes? What kind of ideas do you have? People in this room, suppose they wanted to meet with a group of physicians or a physician, meet with a legislator, meet with an insurance company representative. Do you have some ideas about how people in this room who come from a seven-state area could take what you know, what you presented, and use that to educate people who can influence decisions about making services available for people at an earlier age? Well, let me answer you in, in, in two stages. Because you're really asking, you know, what would you do? And then the question, how would you carry it out? It, it's clear to me that to do this work with adults you know, is kind. It's a very interesting learning experience. But, but if you take the magnitude of the problem in the population, it, it's really... You know, it's illusory. You're not going to solve the population for the country. You know, for, for a person, for a small number of people, sure. If one is going to do anything, it's going to have to be with children and as early as possible. And the more we think about this, the more we have thought that really even better than starting with children would probably be with pregnant mothers to identify a group of high-risk women in pregnancy. High-risk being women who cannot stop drinking, smoking, or drugging during pregnancy. Women who have an acknowledged history of childhood sexual abuse or rape. Women who gain 100 pounds in pregnancy. Women who are married to an abusive spouse or an alcoholic, etc. And to focus one's attention there. We think, we don't know, but we think that would really be the most effective place to direct one's effort. Another thought that has crossed our minds a number of times is the use of broadcast television to teach, not didactically, but by illustrative example, what good parenting looks like, what bad parenting looks like, and how that plays out. In, in, the, in 1997, the Ford Foundation hosted something called the, the Soap Summit, where they put together a meeting of people who were producers and writers of soap operas basically asking them whether they would be willing to write thematic material relating to public health problems and to soap opera scenarios. And the answer was yes. And to date, no one's done anything useful with that. But I, I believe that would have tremendous potential for reaching enormous numbers of people at very low cost. Now, how, how one would do that with the legislature... Um, it would help a great deal if you knew something about the people in the legislature. For instance, in the state of California, the attorney general, a guy named William Lockyer, um, acknowledges publicly that he was molested as a child. He's pretty interested in the subject. That's a big help. You know, undoubtedly, that'll be true in Utah, or South Dakota, or anywhere else. The question is how you would find that individual. But... I think that would strike me as being the, 
the most efficient way of trying to find a helpful inside person who would work with you and get you the invitation for presentation of information. Yes? Well, you know, you have to understand Kaiser is an enormous organization. Uh, we have roughly 10 million members around the country and God knows how many doctors, etc. And you know, mo most of the doctors don't want to go near this with a pole. Um, I presented this information to our pediatrics department a couple of years ago and I asked at the end, I mean, there's really good people. There's about 70 of them there that took care of my kids. You know, some of them were my friends. And I remember asking them, maybe there's one or two of you who would like to meet with me a couple of times, how we could think about how we could do something with this. Because really, you know, so much of what we're seeing in internal medicine is a result of what wasn't seen in pediatrics, even though it was there. And I, I mean, I was a man, I figured, you know, free lunch, I'll pay the bill. Somebody, a couple of people will surely put their hands up I got a big round of applause, <laughs> and no one's hand went up. So, so I would say that most people shy away from this greatly. You know, in, in, in part out of embarrassment, we are all accultured to know that one doesn't talk about certain things. Yeah, it's not nice to. One doesn't ask about certain things. It's not nice to. And that leaves you really kind of in a weak position to know how to deal with these things. Then. To my knowledge, no, but if you have any ideas how to do that, I'd be certainly happy to listen. <laughs> okay. So, so what I would say is, in terms of Kaiser Permanente, it, it has radically changed the nature of one department. And because of the style in which we leave, leave our footprints in the unified medical record we use in San Diego, it's undoubtedly affected the thinking of a number of physicians. How much it's changed their behavior is hard to tell. Yes? I wanted to make a few different comments. I am, I'm a psychologist in private practice, and I do a lot of psychological evaluations on parents that have had their children removed for DCF, from, by DCFS for abuse and neglect. And as I started doing these, more and more, you know, I couldn't believe the amount of, of course, the people that were you know, most of this is, it's probably 95% mothers I'm seeing, very, you know, 5% fathers in all these hundreds of evaluations I do. And most of them, you know, a good percentage have been, you know, either emotionally, physically, or sexually abused, sometimes, of course, all. And sometimes, you know, when you start asking them the questions about, you know, sexual abuse or something, you find a long string, you know, eight rapes throughout their life or whatever. And so, basically, I feel like I anecdotally see the same pattern you see, of just, it's sort of like these kids had these bad, these people had these bad childhoods and their lives just keep going on, just worse and worse. You know? Yeah, and, and sometimes well concealed by great professional success, which is coupled by a disastrous personal life. Right, and in my case, it's, they usually don't have that great sure. personal success. But usually where they're headed is losing their children forever, sure. which is about the worst thing that can happen to you. And so then they've got, the children who are sort of abandoned by their parents and we're starting all over with the process. Sure. Yes? You alluded earlier to the um, process that happens between the, um, the bad childhood and being raped uh, at a later age. Yeah, good point. What do you all think about that? How do you think that occurs? And because, you know, the link is for sure there and you may remember that the prevalence of rate of at least, of being raped at least once, the prevalence with an A score of four or more was 33%. One in three people, one in three women. So, so how does that work? Yes? I, I, I can't hear you.
and not thinking there was anything wrong with that, such that they might put themselves into a dangerous situation and not even realize it was dangerous. Yeah, well, well, That's well, what yeah, well any other thoughts? Yes. Have you done any sub analysis, factor analysis of the different contributing factors in those ACEs scores that they build? Because one study on sexually abused girls showed a six times greater rate of rape subsequent to being sexually abused during childhood. Sure. If you're asking, did we look carefully at one category versus another, yes, we did. And we decided not to bother publishing anything about that because it was looking at, at trivia. And it would be very, very tempting to take the easy way out and look at trivia. Similarly, although we clearly looked at racial differences, at ethnic differences, and so forth, and there are some, we decided not to publish that for the same reason. It was going to just be distracting from the main point. If you look at the eight categories of adverse childhood experiences, yes, if you look at different outcomes, there are some minor differences between them. If you don't know better, you might you know, think they were important. But they're like 30% differences, et cetera, and here we are talking about numbers 3,000% and so on. So we specifically decided not, not to let that noise out. The same, the same thing with ethnic, and you know, maybe it can show that Italians are worse than Greeks or, you know, Jews are worse than Mormons or whatever, and all you do is set up a lot of internecine warfare and, and accomplish nothing while missing the greater point. The greater point being that this whole problem is so distressing to people that most people don't want to go anywhere near it, and it's a lot more comforting if you have to, to look at some crumb. Yes? Yes, Cer certainly so. Yes. Did you do any studies um, involving children with people with high ACE scores, so to speak, so, and their likelihood of suffering a uh, burden? No, not, not formally, but I can tell you anecdotally uh, my experience. And over the past 17 years now, I have interviewed in depth almost 2,000 individuals and, and followed many of them. Um, and, um, you know, there's no question about the, the power of intergenerational transfer of this. Um, you look at, at people where a whole sequence of children has, have been molested um, through, through the generations. You look at the propagation of alcoholism through a family, you know, which, which of course is what makes people want to take the easy, oh, it must be genetic. You know, like, like all speaking the same language in the family is genetic. You know, might be, but hardly makes the case. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Okay, you're asking, is the questionnaire that we used available? The ACE study questionnaire, which is really a research document, is in the literature. It's, it's in the first paper we published in 1998. Uh, if you want the Kaiser Permanente questionnaire, yeah, email me. I'll be happy to uh, send you a PDF file with uh, copies in there. See, the nice thing about the general medical questionnaire that we have developed is that we've buried these things in with other questions. You know, including we've come to reconceptualize the nature of certain questions. Like we had in there a question, we have in there a question about multiple fractures. And I assumed when I put that question in years ago that I was asking an orthopedic question. <laughs> but then but then for a brief period of time I was the startup medical director of a psychiatric <laughs> hospital that we own. And I put in the medical intake machinery, and that question was there, and I was startled to find that 70% of the people in that hospital had a history of three or more lifetime fractures. Yes? Did you put anything 
Not, not that we've published, and I'm trying to think um, whether we have a question uh, about household income, and, and I'm afraid I, I can't bring that to mind right now. I know we've discussed it innumerable times. Um, however, if one were, you know, if you wanted to, to discuss the point, I would probably choose to take the view that one ought to look at poverty as an outcome rather than a causal factor lest one end up trying to figure out how come Christ and Gandhi and Mother Teresa did not have a bad influence on the people around them when they were poor. Um, so so I, you know, I've come to see that this is a good way to, to, to get poor. Yes? Louder, please. Yeah, your, 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 your point is very well taken because although we have not studied the point formally, again anecdotally and, and talking with about 2,000 people, it's, it's pretty clear that, that teaching children about sex in the households of the people whom I see as patients is not something that occurs. You know, it's, it's learned from classmates, etc. It's learned on the street. Um, not in any organized kind of way, either in schools or in families. Yes? I, I, I still can't hear you. Bellow. <laughs> Let me take the easy part of your question. You know, might not insurance companies use this negatively to put people in high risk category? Con conceivably, I, I've not seen anything in particular to, you know, to, to suggest that that operationally is likely to happen. In fact, most insurance companies understand that taking individuals in is very high risk because individuals lie through their teeth. Taking groups in is far more satisfactory. It's a lot less expensive administratively to bring in a thousand members, you know, at a time than, than one member at a time a thousand times. And although you will have some pretty sick people in the group, you will have some, you know, a lot of healthy people hopefully to offset that. So, so what you're saying is, is commonly raised. I don't, I don't see it as a big operational issue. Yes. How can you email me? Um, with a computer? <laughs> VJF MD SDCA, as in San Diego, California, at MSN, as in Microsoft Network, dot com. Okay, one minute. Yes, is that someone's hand? Or? <laughs> Can you, add, can you ask for the slides? Um, um, no, because I need them tomorrow morning. <laughs> but, 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 but if you, <laughs> and, they're too, and they're too big because of the video clips to send as an email attachment. I mean, this, this joke is the system. Um, if you email me um, and remind me, I'll be happy to send you a paper copy of all of the slides, and then you can reproduce it for all the people out here. Yes? I just have one comment.
comment. Uh, I know that the challenge is going to be to educate the medical community. Uh, I think we're a long ways from that. Do you have any suggestions on how the mental health community can promote a driving force to educate the medical sure. community around this Yes, community? Without, without question I do. Um, I gave up long ago trying to ruin my life changing medical schools. Um, I think, however, it's realistic to try to change the expectation of patients. If you can do that successfully, basically by showing them you know, a different way of what might be available, etc., then you've created a potent market force to change what's supplied, particularly at a time when there are large organizations responsive to market forces. So you know, my own efforts currently are designed towards trying to take out uh, uh, into the community a nonprofit organization to, to demonstrate this to patients, to make it available to people at low cost and large number, and thereby change patient expectations and thereby change market forces. Thank you for inviting me. For further information and updates about Dr. Vincent Felitti and Dr. Robert Anda's Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, please visit the study's website at www.astudy.org.